Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for uh, coming here. Uh, I'm Ian Boyd from the EAUC, for those of you who, who don't know me. Um, and for all of those that I saw on Monday night, it's been a long week already. Green Gown Awards, it went really well, so thank you for all of that. Uh, the biggest thanks today, though, goes down to British Gas. And I can uh, sense already um, some of the conversations that we've had about um, what you might be expecting today. Well, um, the guys from British Gas here clearly understand the opportunity they have to gain knowledge from you. So I've avoided the word sales, so let's all, thank you, let's all just relax. So today is an education day. Uh, British Gas really want to get your input into the EPC, warts and all. I've warned them, yeah, so we've, we've got a couple of spiky people here and myself, so you know, we will be asking questions. Uh, and in a constructive way, let's find out what they've done, what they've learned, what they're thinking is, and they work in other sectors. Um, so let's learn from that as well, because you know, we don't always know the answers. Um, so, starting off today, I'd like to introduce Gav, their MD, uh, to actually launch today for British Gas. Thank you very much, Gav, for having us. Thank you. Um, firstly, uh, welcome. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, this isn't a sales pitch. Um, actually, I'm not very good at selling. So, um, if it is a sales pitch, it's a bad one. Um, second thing is also, I, um, uh, Fridays are our casual day. But obviously you guys are coming in, so I've sort of done a bit of a half combination <laughs> jeans at the bottom, hoping that the camera just gets me from the belt up. Um, and then, um, so let me just talk a little bit about, giving you a little bit of an introduction as to who we are. Um, so this is an obvious slide. So I look after, I look after the part of British Gas which caters for business customers, but providing services for business customers. So that covers all types of renewable technology, gas and electrical type of services, um, and um, whether it's local authorities, uh, whether it's university schools, hospitals, all the way from small businesses to large businesses. So that's what we do. It covers around 2,000 people, mainly uh, people who do stuff to kit. So we recognise as a business that whilst we our heritage has come through being a gas supplier and an electricity supplier, just providing the commodity is not, um, is not going to uh, be a key strategic growth area for British Gas and for Centrica going forward. And in fact, being more engaged with customers around the actual service, around what you do with the energy, what kits you have, how you engage with it, how much volume you use, how to make that efficient, efficient is a key focus area for us. That's why my business unit exists. Um, so the reason for that is because strategically a few years ago, we agreed as, uh, as a business centric hub, which British Gas is part of, that we no longer want to be an energy business. We want to become an energy services company that offers energy, but no longer an energy company alone. Now, it takes a lot to make that shift when a large part of your business, 12 million residential customers buy energy for, from us, so that's half of the market in the residential sphere. So there's a super tanker that does energy and then we're trying to go off and do services. And at the home it's easy because we have boiler people fixing boilers, but trying to capture the whole energy efficiency agenda and do that um, means that this business unit is a bit, uh, a bit of an outlier is more than Nick Correct of Philip Morris. So we, um, we, we always are trying to improve and innovate, take the latest technologies, but operate within our larger business. So you're talking to business services, us, around trying to fix um, energy efficiency and the usage part of your business. We're not here to talk about price um, at all. Now, why do we make that shift? We made that shift because customers, is this the, the laser work on this thing? Um, um, oh geez, I can't put forward. So customers want this, customers talk to us about it. Different customers want it for different reasons. Some are very purely about cutting costs. So we, have, we work with some large retail businesses where it's all about cutting costs. They'll pretend it's about growing, but in reality they're just trying to cut their costs. Um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot who are doing it for, for corporate social responsibility. And having that flavour to it is important. Um, when oil prices are high, 
that may that, that's seen as more important. When the economy is booming, green is big on the agenda. When the economy is suffered, you'll find that green falls off the agenda. For us to be able to be credible and relevant in the market, we had to do it to ourselves. So we decided to lead by example as an energy business and try to do carbon reduction across our whole business. Now this is a new building, but in this building you will see the latest technology and I think you're getting a tour later of all the different uh, technology that's, that's, that's here. But that's just to give you a sense of what is available. This is a new building, but what we do for hospitals, for schools, for universities is retrofit the energy kit so that you can have the same sort of energy reduction and we've reduced the, um, from whether it's small businesses to, to large um, public sector uh, buildings, we've reduced consumption of around 20%. So you no longer need to talk about price, you can take your costs a lot that way. So the um, uh, team will go through exactly what we did on the building, but in terms of some rough numbers, across all of British Gas, of which we have around two, sorry, across all of Centrica, we have around 200 properties. We made a commitment in 2007, as part of the overall commitments are made by the UK and others, to reduce our energy consumption by 20%. And we basically, by, by the end of 2013, and that line continues, We've actually got to minus 22%, and the reason we've done that is that we've had some huge um, focus on upgrading the kit in buildings, electrifying our fleet. So I think we're going to get a chance to see electric vehicles la later, or get dropped off for those who need some transport. We've got an electric vehicle that scoots around, so you'll see that. And we've continued to invest in innovation, whether it's building controls, smart meters, the latest type of um, energy efficiency equipment, whether it's solar panels, solar thermal, biomass, etc. You'll see all that today. So that's, so that's what we've done. We've decided to do that so we can show that as a case study. So when people ask what is possible, you can see what we've done. And that allows us to um, uh, grow successfully in the market. And I think you'll be, as later we're going to go through some of the case studies and some of the examples of what we're doing today with, with other public sector businesses. So um, today's agenda is to talk a little bit about our, our story, the buildings, the, the fleet, the uh, scope of the energy uh, market as we go through. There's some time for lunch and then we will spend a little bit more time in detail to go through energy performance contracting. And uh, as Ian said, this is not a cookie cutter thing. This is a partnership. Energy performance partnering rather than contracting means that we work together to find the ideal solution for you. For some businesses, it's about cutting costs. For others, it's about releasing capital. For others, it's about, there's, there's all different types of objectives. Under, understanding your objectives then drives what we decide, you know, what we decide together is the best solution for your, for your um, particular situation. And we've changed, we're technology agnostic, so we can change different technologies that are available. We, we're, whether your payback is to get paybacks with an earlier period or a longer period, or whether you need to worry about what interest rates you pay or how you configure the asset structure, we can work through all of that flexibility with you. So we'll go through some of those examples as an NHS case study. There's looking what the behavioural change um, does, <coughs> what we can do to grow um, green, uh, green jobs in the community. And then um, we, we're going to set up a panel so you can ask some questions direct and we can really get into some extra detail there. So I think we'll, it's a short agenda from 11 to 3, but hopefully it's packed for you and at 3 o'clock you can head off and beat the traffic, of which Oxford is uh, notoriously difficult to get around if you don't get the right window. So that's it really. Um, if, uh, unless there are any questions, I'm happy to move on to the next, next agenda item. Yeah. Yes. Uh, University of Warwick, you, you aim to talk about the uh, behavioural change in the performance contracting session. Yeah. Have you done anything in your building here? As, as I understand, we'll have a presentation of your building here. Have you, do you have any activities with your own staff to engage them and take, you, take, take them with you on the journey? Yes, we do. So we uh, clearly we, we, uh, we promote um, 
uh, being green and we promote a lot about um, uh, uh, energy efficiency to the staff. A lot of what we do, a lot of what we've done is um, is trying to put in gear that allows people, allows the building to reduce energy so that if people aren't in offices, the energy, the lights go out and, um, and that type of thing. There are uh, lots of case studies of what we do and some of the team will give some of those examples as we go through in more detail. But different, different buildings have different things. We have, but just to, just to be clear, with the centric of buildings that we had that 20% reduction, our business unit went out and treated them as a customer, a different legal entity, and went out and upgraded the kit, changed the lighting, changed the uh, building management systems, um, and through that process, talked through all those changes with the, with the staff at that building so that they knew that that was happening. So, but those little case studies, those nuggets, you should talk to some of the members of the team will give you that. I mean, it's fair, it's fair to say, so I think this has been ongoing for a long time, and the behavior awareness um, program, I wouldn't say it's been hugely formal. Um, there, there's been pockets, it's like many organisations, there's been a bit done, and then typically with behaviour awareness, then you kind of stop doing it, and then you start doing it again, and then stop doing it. So it's been done in pockets. With the company that's coming in um, at, to, to talk about this it is someone we, we partner with, and it's someone quite, quite widely known inside the um, public sector. But they have um, methods of measuring more tangibly what, what the behavioural change effects are. Um, I mean, I've been doing energy efficiency for 25 years, and I always look at it and think if you've got a small building, say your home or a building that's not bigger than a home, people in that building can make a huge difference on, on the energy efficiency of that building just by changing their behaviours. When you get into a building like this, this building is, well, I'll go through it in a minute, it's so automated, actually there isn't a great deal individuals can do. Um, they can do a more sustainable thing, e.g. how do they get to the office, how do they car share, those sort of things. But, but in this office, no one can turn a light off. <laughs> it's, it's quite difficult. So um, it's, it's kind of a balance, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. I think and there's, about, and there's, a, there's a spectrum of different offerings depending on what the particular objectives are of each business. Yeah, it's making sure that whatever you do around behavioural change is right for the building. So as Mike said, this is an office where individual staff can't actually do that much to the system. But if you go into the university halls, for example, they've made the building users and they actually want some control around the heating, around the lighting. Um, similar in terms of a lot of the work we're doing around the NHS. Um, they're in a similar environment where actually a lot of the clinical teams want to be able to <coughs> control um, temperatures on wards because there's you know, health care requirements for you to do that. So it's really making sure that whatever you do is fit for purpose. And um, the session that we've got at five past two should hopefully get in there. Okay, so, oh, one just, question. <coughs> just a little bit more about your business unit. Yep. And what's the sort of scale of it? Is it sort of revenue, employees, that kind of stuff? Yeah, so there's 2,000 people. Um, it's around 300 million of revenues. Um, uh, about a third is large scale uh, companies and um, public sector, large stuff, things like universities or large corporates. Um, a third is more along the lines of boiler installation, electrical installation um, for small businesses. And then another third works on service and repair and installation for the uh, local authorities via, um, through the social housing market. So okay. it's roughly sort of rough to equate that way. Do you do any kind of like seeding of innovation or anything like that? I mean, your supply chain, how do you work? So, so we're agnostic about technology. Yeah, so we're technology agnostic. We sort of consider ourselves more as a supermarket and listen to what customers <coughs> want and select the technology that's right, rather than necessarily being we've got a product and we're just going to sell that product. Um, and so therefore, when we go in, especially around a retrofit, whether it's a university or a school or a hospital, we'll look at what's there and depending on what's available, we may decide that what's right is a CHP plant or a biomass or maybe, maybe there's a need for solar panels, but that can wait a couple of years, and we can, we can decide from what's available. Uh, and we constantly look for new technology that might make sense for the yeah. business. And I think where I'm coming from is, do you see yourself as a, as a big spender in this market to be like taking risk with technology that isn't proven, or are you at, well, let someone else prove it first and we'll, we'll take it off the supermarket shelf? Right. 
Maybe that's a provocative question. No, 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 it's a very good question. Um, uh, <coughs> traditionally, we have not been the case that we want to. We probably, once, once a product is proven and it works, and um, then we will, we, will, we will push it. Um, if it gets an incentive, like a feed-in tariff or a renewable heat incentive, we will push it because it's it can be commercialised. If it's a product that's not commercialised and still in development, we struggle with that. So we, we own a, and I use an example, we own a small percentage of Ceres Power, which is a, a user's um, gas to both heat and create power. Um, that technology still hasn't, well, we made an investment in that, still hasn't come to be scaled up in a way that it can be, uh, be mass sold out. We made an investment in it as a, almost like a venture capital piece, but not necessarily that we push that on customers until we know that it has traction, it's actually there. So we're, we're, we're out of different sides of the spectrum where we invest in new technologies, but we don't necessarily push it. We sort of go from what the customer wants. And are you solely UK focused or are you international? So this is UK focused, this business, okay. because it's British gas. Um, and we haven't necessarily moved into Europe yet. Um, we have a sister business in the Europe, uh, in America, called Direct Energy, which also does a broad sweep of these um, as well. Okay. Okay. I was just going to add, so one of the things, because we, we started the performance contracting business three years ago, and in my idealistic head, that was going to be a way that we could try new technologies and, and innovate. And what we found is the contracts have been developed that are so tight because the NHS and, and they like, want to save the money, they want an absolute guarantee. It stifles innovation because, of course, if you're putting a, a financial guarantee on something year after year for 10, 15 years, you're not going to try something new. For me, the next shift change would be maybe in the university sector, because there's more research and development in that area, is actually to say, right, well, we've got this guarantee here. We're going to deliver that. Actually, why don't we have a proportion, which is an innovation piece, and we, we learn together. That, that would be, you know, back into my idealistic mind when we started, that hadn't actually happened. Well, we're very open to different models, especially if, if it's uh, if along the lines is that we've got the, so most of the kids should give you 20% reduction. We're happy to take a risk on that, that you <coughs> see as a benefit for the university that we try and push that technology because of some um, ecosystem that exists because that university is pushing that technology, then we're happy to take that risk as well as we all don't understand the, the rewards and you know the benefits and the costs of doing that together. We're happy to do that. But obviously, we, we would we love to see more and more innovation because it's important for our development of our brand as well. But on the flip side, we don't try to push anything that doesn't work because. I mean, as you, I can give you an example. So I, I don't, you, you might be familiar with this technology, but there's these pads that you can walk on and they generate electricity when you walk them. So one of the school's projects we've done this year, we put that in, in the entrance hall to generate. Now, there's no way that's commercially viable at all, but it was a brand thing, so we decided to do it. And we can then monitor it, watch the results, actually see is there a way then they've taken that to the next level. But that wasn't a, that was a contract where we're not under a guarantee to deliver it year after year after year. So it's easier to do it in that, in that scenario. I'm well, assuming that's linked to the learning process for uh, the subject you used. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. So it's all linked to a big screen so the children can see how much they're generating when they walk in and everything, and how much the solar is generating and the biomass boiler and everything. So it's, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'm already 10 minutes over the slot. So <laughs> I've destroyed the agenda again. I'm notorious for that, sorry. Um, and I'm happy that I had to go over to this off point. Yeah, I was just going to say, so, um, hi everyone, I'm kind of host for today, and uh, just wanted to reiterate uh, Gab's words. Thank you very much for all the night and journeys on Friday afternoon and morning. Um, we've um, hopefully got a agenda which is going to interest you. Please do ask questions as we go along. We want to hear your feedback. And um, our first speaker is Mike Chesham. So Mike actually joined our business when we bought <laughs> his company. Um, so he was, he's been on this journey that Gab's been talking about ever since the start. Um, he now heads up our energy construction business, which is responsible for putting in um, energy efficient technology. And he's going to be talking through um, the Oxford building that we have uh, here today. Um, he's going to give an introduction to some of the challenges that we've faced in design and construction and also um, talking through our, our consideration when we're choosing different technologies 
um, and we'll then break up into two separate groups and we'll hopefully have a bit of a tour of, um, of the building and see some of those technologies in place as well. So I'll hand over to Mike. Thanks, Chris. Um, so as I said, I'm, I'm Mike Chesson. So my title is, um, I think it's Director of Energy Construction Services, which is uh, sometimes his head, sometimes his head, head director. I report to GAD. Um, the third GAD is talking about that I run is the big stuff. So I do all of the big business to business, CHPs, solar, BMS, massive retrofit. Um, so it's a hundred million pound a year business. Um, it's, it's quite fast paced and although you know, there's this big tanker, which is the British gas machine going forward. We are like a little speedboat at the side and we're just whizzing along trying to change things and do things differently. So it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting business. And I've been here for four years now. So um, we've, we've grown quite a bit. We've had a 400% growth, so it's been huge. Um, one area we haven't done much work in, in, in this area is university. So it's, it's good to see everyone here today. And hopefully we might sort of just bring some ideas on rather than us trying to sell you anything. I don't, I'm conscious I don't want to. Selling stuff. So, um, so this this building we moved here. Uh, I'm going to get the dates wrong. Right February 2013. Um, I was involved in checking some of the design. So they put forward lots of design and innovation, and then they said, "Who have we got in the business that isn't from supply that actually might understand what how the, how a building works?" So they said, "I know a business guy." So they sent it to me, and it was very interesting because when you when you read it. Clearly someone had come forward and said there's some brilliant ideas, but then people had um, design engineered um, all of the really good stuff out. So I was looking through saying, well hang on a second, we were going to have a biomass, we were going to have PV, we were going to have a bit, of, a bit of solar thermal or a good BMS system and I could, could see that they were being whittled away. So what we said was hang on a second, if we want to bring customers here, we want to tell them the sort of things we're doing to customers, we want all that back in. So we were fortunate enough that despite people trying to engineer it out, and I know that happens on most new builds and on retrofit projects, you always get things taken out. Um, we, we, we were able to get it back in, so you'll, you'll see a lot of those today. So, the really good things, it's a Briam excellent building. There aren't many Briam excellent buildings. There's more now, but there wasn't. When this was built, there, there, was, only, there was only a few around in the country. And this, is, this has got an EP, EPC rating of A. So again, there's only two of those in Oxford, I believe. And, and this is, the most energy efficient building in Oxford, um, as far as I'm aware, of. certainly up to, up to a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, you, whether it, it obviously costs quite a bit more money to build it like this, but actually, if, if you take a long term view on things, it will pay for itself over and over again over the life of this building. So, it's, it's definitely a worthwhile investment. Um, and it's also one workplace environment. I don't, Joel, who, who was that? What was the uh, body that ordered the sack? Put you on the spot? Yeah, I'm not sure. Was it Thames Valley? Award. Was it? Okay, so quite an open award. So, um, and it is, a, it is a great place to work. I mean, many of us came, we had a small office in Reading when we started. It was a tiny little unit, um, and it was, we were all crammed in there. It was, it was ridiculous. Um, but we came here, and everyone thought, well, the journey's a lot further, and it's Oxford, and Oxford and notoriously bad for traffic, notoriously difficult to park, but we'll get, we'll get onto that in a minute. Um, but actually, um, it is a great place to work, environmentally wise. When we walk around, you'll see it's light, it's airy, it, it creates thinking rather than a, kind of an oppressive, I'm sat in an office, it's dark, it's not very nice. So it's an incredible building to come and work in. So I know everyone who works here, the supply guys used to be in three buildings just across the road there and they were terrible places to work. Really, really, you, you were there, didn't you, Chris? Yes, it was. So on, on, on this line of obviously the building, would you be willing to share what the cost per square meter all, all together? I'd ask. I can ask. Yeah. I'll take that away if someone, Joe, if you can grab that as a Drop them in email. You, know, you pay for what you get. So. Yeah, you do. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that, but we will have a look. Yeah. Um, there's, there's an interesting point I'll get onto. Sorry, Chris, you're going to go. No, I was, I was just going to say that. So <coughs> when it was designed, we were all going to look at that bit straight away. So when it was designed, it was it, all these things were thrown into the mix of how we make it a really, really great place to work. Um, and and they, they did a huge amount of work on you know, full life cycle. People do this, cost consultants do this full life cycle designs and everything. But ultimately, everything always gets taken out when the finance guy gets hold of it. And we were lucky enough not, not, not to happen to us. So, so, um, so all, of the, all of these things here, I won't read them out, um, have definitely been adhered to. The, the, the travel bit is interesting. So um, most people who work here don't drive here. Um, there are 600 to 800 people here every day. 
Um, there is only parking for 200 people, 200 cars. So, and that's part of the Oxford Planning uh, Commission. So you can't, you know, it's one in four ratio. That's, that's the design. So we have a car share. Sorry, yeah. So in terms of people then, how important is that in your consideration in terms of, yes, you've got the building, you've got the technologies, but there are people involved. Yeah. And it may be that they can be um, more of a challenge than technology. So yeah. How did you cope with that? <laughs> so, again, coming, coming from Reading, where there was loads of parking spaces, um, it, it, at first, it's like many things, everybody thought it was going to be a real problem. Everybody was saying, well, hang on, how are we going to make this work? There's only 200 spaces. Um, but what you quickly find is, is when people come to a building like this and they come to work in it, actually they forget about that very quickly because it's such a nice place to work. So mentally, it's all, it, like many things in life, it's, it always think, you think it's going to be worse than it ever actually is. Um, so you'll see we've got a massive cycle shed here, loads of people cycle to this building. We've got a lot of car, we've got a big car sharing scheme, so people are not allowed to park in there because obviously car sharing schemes are often open to abuse and people trying to get around the rules. You can't do it in this building. If you, if you do it, you get banned from the here. You won't be bringing your car in again. So you have, to, you have to be a member of the car sharing scheme and you have to come to work with someone else in your car. Um, you can't do it otherwise. Um, internal people can't book visitors' car parking spaces, so there's no sort of way around that rule either. So it, is, it does drive people like me to get at 7 o'clock in the morning, which isn't ideal. But, but, uh, but then there, is a, there is an overflow car park, which is about I half a mile away. Um, which is an old Royal Mail building, but again, people when it's when it's summer, it's lovely. When it's winter, people don't want to be there. So it, you know they have to think about different ways of getting here. Uh, the roadworks around the Ring Road here are always a, a disaster. So yeah, you probably find more people get annoyed about the travel here than they ever do about the conditions of the building. Uh, we don't get any complaints about the conditions of the building. So technologies-wise, it's really great because we've got. Although we're agnostic, we, we're putting most of the things that actually you want to put in a new build or even you know, a retrofit. Um, so the biomass, which I'll show you in a minute, there are, there are three 100 kilowatt biomass boilers in here, um, which, which we put in biomass boilers in many parts of the country. We've got our own internal uh, business um, which does it, um, called Ecology, and Paul, Paul's here today from Ecology. Um, so if you want to know more about biomass boilers, Paul, Paul, Paul's sitting in the back there. So so you can ask him a team break. Um, but uh, you know, we, we do we do put in very large ones into the NHS estate, big ones, sort of the, the 999 kilowatt ones, because those are the ones that get the most RHI. Um, so they're real real good incentive, certainly for over the next 20 years to, to put in um, biomass boilers, especially if you've got oil. If you have oil fired boilers, well, I mean the, the investment case is brilliant, so it's worth looking at. Um, we've got solar thermal, solar thermal again it's 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 only a small array, we've got a 30 kilowatt array here for solar, solar thermal. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an okay technology, I don't think it's ever going to save the planet, but it's an okay technology that, that, that can be used. The key to that is you've really got to have, it's not ideal in this building, because really you need a large um, water load 24-7 if you're going to make it financially viable. So you have um, a swimming pool then? No, we've got no swimming pool now, unfortunately. <laughs> what we've got is a great big storage tank. So we tend to store it at night and then people, because we've got showers in here, so lots of people who cycle or run in, they use the showers, so we store it at night and then they use it in the morning, so actually it's kind of, it's an okay balance, it's not the best commercial investment on all of these. Um, we've got a 100 kilowatt peak solar array up there, which you'll see as well, and that, that, um, that's quite core to our business. I think we've seen, you know, the, the solar business go through the roof um, up until about three years ago, and literally, that's about an analogy. Um, and then, because of the fit, government fit changes overnight, the whole business collapsed. And, and you know, many, many. There were three thousand registered solar companies back then, and now there's there's probably three thousand, but most of them are trading. So now it's, it's sort of whittled down. But actually, the cost of PV has come down enormously. Um, and actually, now, if you look at it on a, on a case by case basis, and for the the longevity of the return on the investment, it's 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 better than having an annuity. So. Many, many pension funds are buying PV farms like there's no tomorrow because they know that you can get a 7% yield on that, which is better than you can get if you, if you just put your money into an annuity. So it's, it's a very good technology um, and, and simple. It's robust, it's simple, it's not complicated. Um, lighting, all of these lights above you are all LED lights, so if anyone's got any worries about should we put LED lights in where people are working, is a technology 
robust enough? Is, does it make you go funny and wobbly? Well, no, it doesn't. It's LEDs is commonplace now. This whole building has it in. We've retrofitted it into most of our buildings across the central estate as well. Um, so that, that's been done. Um, and also in here, um, you'll see you've got, you've got sensors up here. So you've got movement sensors. So again, there's no light switches in like there are light switches in the wall, but if no one's in here, it gets switched off. So. Um, and it's also on the light levels as well, so the outside banks will switch off if the light levels are uh, big enough for the windows. Um, cladding, the building is, is very, it's uh, really heavy on cladding um, because insulation properties, again, to get planning permission are, are very essential nowadays. So um, we, we retrofit insulation into a lot of our performance contracts we do. Um, it, it's, again, quite a long payback. It's not the quickest payback, but it's still essential if you want to get the building really efficient you've got to stop throwing the heat out of it, so it's, it's pretty key. Uh, we've got electric vehicle charging, charging points, electric vehicles comes under me as well, the, the charging points, not that we don't manufacture vehicles, but uh, Colin's going to talk about what we do with our fleet a bit later. Um, so we are the largest installer of electric vehicle charging points in the UK, which is, uh, again, not many people know that, but it's, it, it's, it's the case, whether it's domestic or it's business. Um, <coughs> and the world I came from, which is building management systems, everything in here and everything across all the centre for estate and on all the performance contracts we do is all linked back to a central bureau so that someone is sitting there every day looking at customers' sites, looking at our own sites and making sure that all the good work we've done doesn't then get undone because it's very easy, you know, in an emergency situation the maintenance guy gets called out because something's, the heating's not working or the, the boiler's failed, the pumps have failed the maintenance guy will come to site I've got to get the heating back onto my building. They will turn it on manually, nine times out of ten, unless someone's looking at it, it will run in manual for the next few months until someone goes and just does a maintenance visit. And that, that for me, the world I came from, that is, you can have all of this nice stuff, we'll get onto this next thing, like, you, can have, you can have all of this nice stuff, but if you don't run it efficiently, it's just no point putting it in, you're just wasting money, it's a bad investment. So, by the way, if anyone's got any questions, I'm just waffling on here, so if anyone's got any questions, please, please feel free to ask again or ask again. So, With those technologies that you went through, which yeah. did have the best payback? You uh, said that some of them didn't have very good payback. But yeah, so, yeah so reverse order <laughs> um, off the top of my head. Let's, let's go back to one year. So um, I'm going to do this off the top of my head now. So I would say that the quickest, quickest payback of any of those is the BMS. That's the quickest payback. So that's good. No, no, because that is a very low investment, but actually if you're monitoring it, it's a very quick payback. Um, the LED lighting, very quick payback um, nowadays, because the capital cost of LED has gone down. If you're putting it in a new building, it's a lot cheaper than if you retrofit, because sometimes when you retrofit, the wiring might need upgrading, or there might be some you know, some sort of non-compliance, and that, that causes that um, investment not to be as, as good. Um, but certainly new builds, we, we, most, of the, most of the projects we do, um, Apart from so Jason's at the back here, and so, um, we, we just we just did a big job at St George's NHS Trust, and that's the first trust we've done where we aren't doing the lighting because they've done so much of it themselves. They've already gone to T5, and then T5, if they didn't talk too technical now, but T5 is quite efficient anyway. So to go from T5 to LED is not a particularly big investment, um, but I'm sure across most of the university estate they've got a mixture of T8s, T12s, T5s, 2Ds, all sorts of different types of. Uh, technologies. Um, so um, the next one is probably close between biomass and PV, to be honest, at the moment. It, it, it's marginal, which one's better? PV, because the cost has come down so much and it's actually easier, it's more established to get fits to make sure you get the, the sizing of it right. Biomass is still relatively early, but when the RHI is added, it's still a good investment, depending on the size of the biomass. Um, and a lot, I suppose, so thermal and, and cladding are probably that. One thing I'm missing, which is part of our energy strategy, is high efficiency gas boilers. Yes. Have you got any? We've got the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so because this building is an office building, the biomass copes with it all. Okay. So we have we have yeah, high efficiency backup boilers, but they're only backup, they're not used. Okay. The gas consumption is good. So I'll can I'll cancel out my energy strategy going forward. Um yeah, I mean if you get your biomass, it depends how big your load is. Yeah, we don't we don't have land space to put biomass. Right. And, and, and obviously delivery of biomass, oh. you need to have the infrastructure to take that. Yeah, you'll, you'll see here it's actually very simple, but yeah, once you get up to the, if you get up to say the one we're doing in a, in a, in a NHS trust as well, which is 
easy to get to, because yeah. they had oil before, so of course they had the infrastructure for the tankers for oil. Um, you'd be talking probably three deliveries of a massive load of pellets, uh, uh, which it pellets, every week. So if you're in an inner city, or you're you know, in London, in London, there's hardly any light mass, but if you're in, in an inner city, it's actually quite difficult. So absolutely, yeah. Go, go another route, go the high efficiency boiler route, or, or, or look at ground source, maybe, or some other, some other way of generating. How do you source your biomass? Um, well, I have no idea, is the honest answer. <laughs> Um, so we usually, if we're doing a project, say, I know in the Welsh one, it's Celtic Fuels are supplying it direct to the trust, so we don't actually get involved with the supply of the, of the, of the biomass itself. Centrica will have a great big contract with some huge biomass, because we have some biomass um, in our generation um, plant now, but, but we, we house this quite small scale, so um, there, are, there are quite a few. There's a, there's a, there's a government website, you go on the debt websites, Give you, give you a list of the ones that are good quality because you need the good quality fuel to get the RHI. So. But if you want, I mean, we can always send something out if you need, need some help sort of finding one, we can, we can send you a link out. I noticed you haven't got CHP in your list there. Was there a particular reason you didn't have that, or it just, it just wasn't necessary with that combination? Yeah, in an office building, you're already testing the boundary space, so in Berlin, yeah. really. Um, so actually, CHP because we have you need, you need a CHP needs to run about 17 hours a day every day, you know. So you get about 92 percent of the year it's running. We, we if we had a swimming pool, if David Lloyd was a bit closer, <laughs> it would have been perfect community school where they could have taken the heat. But actually, for again for a university, you, you've generally got a distributed heat network. So if you've got a distributed heat network, you're going to have a 24-hour load because you're going to need lots of hot water for students to shower. And even, even during the summer, you, you know, you're going to have foreign students visiting or whatever you have, so there, there will be definite, I would say in a, in a university it would be a no-brainer. And, and every, every NHS trust, is anyone we haven't put a CHP? Apart from one, I know we've had it, guys. Oh yeah, yeah, guys, guys, guys have one already, but yeah. yeah. So, um, What's been learned? I think, I think the first one is kind of coming kind of given. Um, you, you, you can do both. You can design it around users and make it energy efficient. I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer, really. That you definitely get it. But, but I think the second one's more important. So when, when we started the building up, like everything else, they put all the technologies in. But it took, I would say, at least six months to a year before anyone started <coughs> looking at the actual performance of the building to say, well, hang on, we're not actually looking at how it's performing. Is it switching on and off at the right times? Are we making sure everything's running for as short as possible time. That didn't happen for a quite a long time. So um, that's, I suppose, classic, you build a building, you don't hand it over to the, to the users properly, and everyone runs away as fast as they can. We can build a new building. But actually, luckily, because we have the intelligent people in here who are doing this day to day, we just put a hand up and said, hang on a second, what's going on here? We need to, we need to get in. So actually, I mean, I noticed one morning, the chillers were blaring away. It was, it was cold outside, and I was thinking, in this building, why do we need the chillers running? You don't need chillers running. And it was purely because they were just set up to run on the time schedule, and no one had thought, that actually, they're really efficient chillers, <coughs> but they don't need to be on. So there's a big saving there straight away. So the half hour data on this side is really, really low, so I can't even use it. Um, yeah, this is a, a, the solution is more important. I mean, there are solutions on here which, which if I gave you the pounds per square meter, if, you, if you're doing a retrofit in university, you think, I'm not going to spend that amount of money. You shouldn't really. Um, but for here, it was the right thing for us to do from a brand perspective, we wanted to do it. Um, but don't ag ask, agnostic as Gav says, we, we have our own companies, but on every job we do, we have a value, you know, in the public sector, we have a value for, value for money test. And, you know, we might invite our internal companies along to tender for that work, but it, it's value for money. We know that it's public sector, we have to demonstrate that, even though we win these jobs, we have to demonstrate it. So we are acutely aware that that is an issue for all public sector bodies. Um, and then most of the things you see today, yeah, they can be retrofitted. We, we retrofit everything you'll see today, we've retrofitted into buildings, into public sector buildings and private sector buildings um, across the UK. I think Chris has got a summary at some point today, he'll show, show what we've done. Um, so I think, without further ado, unless anyone's got any questions, um, we'll call this up towards him. Any questions? Did you do a PRE for establishment of the evaluation <coughs> for this project? Good question. I don't actually know the answer to that. Do we know the answer to that? Because we should have done it. The engineers, because they're going to be taking us around any second, they might have a bit more. Yeah. Just 
something you said earlier when you said you, you don't get any complaints about um, temperatures, comfort, I just found that absolutely astounding. You know, we all have new builds at our universities. And yes. Yeah. I don't tell you what happened. So, so uh, there's a good point. So, what happened when we first moved in? The people who came from those buildings over there, they didn't have any any moving air. They were radiators. Yeah. They were terribly terribly lit and very oppressive. When they came here, like many people who work in buildings which just have radiators, the moment they come into somewhere where there's moving air and that's the heating source and cooling source, you get complaints about drafts. Yeah. So. We had an area at the back of the building where the first thing the maintenance guys did, like I just said, when, when someone um, started complaining, oh, I'm getting a bit drafty, they went up and started fiddling with all the fan coil units yeah. that sit above these ceilings, yeah. and that created this imbalance across the second floor where all the heat was rising up in the atrium. Um, so we got hold of it and said, you can't go changing all the, all the volumes, because as soon as you change one volume control down, well, then the air goes somewhere else, and then something else will start complaining. So we reset them all, and all we did was move people around. We just moved them around so that the people who didn't like the drafts didn't sit under the drafts. And actually, we, we don't really have you know, many complaints. I mean, I'm sure on some days people will complain, but compared to some of the places I worked before, we just, we just don't, which is good. <laughs> I'm not saying we don't get any. So, we're going to break into two groups. I'm going to take one group, which is interesting. I should take this off. <laughs>